Hi guys! Hopefully this is the beginning of quite a series of very interesting broadcasts. This one will be a podcast because I do need to refer to some notes and uh, I'm sorry about the podcast sometimes. Sometimes they just suit me better. So in the light of recent allegations about Prince Andrew, I wanted to revisit his chart. So this is what this uh, broadcast is going to be about, or this podcast. I'm going to look at his chart in the light of these allegations and see if things are going to worsen for him. I'm going to put his chart up on my blog so that you can refer to the chart and the notes I've made on it so it'll all make total sense. And I'll put the link in the description box. I'm also going to look at the future of the royal family. Someone mentioned this, so I will approach it. King Charles versus King William. Will the contagion from Andrew's problems spread to the Queen? And I'm just going to start by saying, in light of the article that was in the Daily Mail the other day, where they actually came out and discussed Ghislaine Maxwell as a Mossad a agent, that she was handling Jeffrey Epstein, and they were running a kind of compromise honey trap operation together. Well, this wasn't any news to those of us in the alternate media, because we've been talking about that for weeks now, months even. But uh, even the mainstream media are beginning to say it now, which makes me think two things. The first one is, are they just trying to fob the whole thing off on a sexual honey trap kind of extortion stroke compromise racket? And are they trying to, is it maybe look fire fire over there where they're trying to divert our attention from something else that's been going on with Jeffrey? And I think that that is what comes through in Prince Andrew's chart, that it's not just about the sexual allegations the young girls Lolita expressed. There's more to it than that. Next question I want to ask is, in my previous uh, vlog where I talked about Epstein and Prince Andrew uh, when he did his interview, I said, well, surely MI5 and all the royal protection officers, they're advising him on who not to have contact with. So why do we have two Mossad agents, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, coming to Buckingham Palace, being inviting to invited to Sandringham, going to Ascot? It seems rather peculiar. So I think... In light of that, maybe we all need to step away from this idea, thinking that MI5 is there to look after the interests of British people or British assets abroad. abroad. And the same with the FSB for Moscow or the, the CIA for America. Maybe what these agencies are really for these days is just looking after the financial assets of the elites, ensuring that the elites maintain that position. Maybe that's what they are more about, and that seems to be what it is in light of this. So just one note, which I think is interesting to, to mention while we're talking about Ghislaine Maxwell and Epstein, William Barr, the current Attorney General, it was actually his father who got Epstein, despite the fact that he had no quali teaching qualifications and that he dropped out of college. It was William Barr's father that got him the role or the uh, teaching position at the Dalton School. And it was from there that everything kind of evolved with Epstein because it was one of the parents of a child of the Dalton School that helped him to get into um, Bear, Bear Stearns. So that kind of rolled from there. So I just thought I'd mention it. So just to discuss Prince Andrew's chart, he is born London, February the 19th, 1960 at 3.30 p.m. His son is on exactly not, 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 not degrees of Pisces. It falls in the eighth house. He has Leo rising. Uranus is rising. His chart ruler, the sun, is opposite Pluto, which is in the second house. He has a very interesting Venus-Mars conjunction in the sixth house in Capricorn. Why that's interesting is because Jeffrey Epstein and Jocelyn Maxwell also have Venus conjunct Mars. So it's quite a sexually charged aspect, that. So when I'm looking at this chart, he's also got Jupiter in Sagittarius, sixth house sun, Saturn in Capricorn, Moon in Scorpio and Moon in Neptune, which are both in Scorpio, in the fourth house. The chart definitely says there's a party animal, kind of fun-loving, adventurous side of him going on here. But it also says to me a lot about finances. So just to start by mentioning one of the transits, when he was doing that disastrous interview, he, Pluto at 22 degrees of Capricorn was exactly square his midheaven, which is in 22 degrees of Aries. And as you know, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that happens this month in January is happening at 22 degrees of Capricorn. Therefore, I think there are going to be problems for him as soon as this month, this firestorm is not over. Plus the fact we had Neptune transiting in Neptune in Pisces 
conjunct his, this is transiting Neptune, conjunct his Mercury in Pisces at the time he was doing that interview. So M Neptune definitely muddies the waters, causes some lying, either intentional or not. Uh, untruthfulness, murking is certainly not a good time to be going into an interview where you need to have all your faculties about you and to be really clear and concise. I think this aspect indicates that he's going to continue obfuscating and kind of running away from things. But I do think that the, the pressure is building and there's going to be more to come out. Hence why we're going to be seeing with Pluto active there um, problems for him in January, as soon as January. So this thing is definitely not over for him. If anything, it's going to get worse. What I think about it as well is his solar arc Jupiter is conjunct his sun. And looking back in his chart, whenever Jupiter was active by solar arc or triggered by solar arc, there was a crisis for the royal family. So this year, I think that either through him or through a general uh, mixture of events, there is going to be more crisis for the royal family. So I'll just talk about his uh, chart in brief. So um, sun in Pisces, watery sign, moon in Scorpio, definitely not satisfied with a life of routine or a nine to five job or anything conventional. Certainly a globetrotter, loves to put his oar in, give his penny worth in, thinks of himself as a kind of savior almost. He, he feels he's on some sort of quasi spiritual mission. He certainly seeks to do something grander with his life. So I think in some ways this is almost uh, Walter Mitty style. In other words, he needs to believe that his life is more significant than it possibly is. Certainly seeking change, wanting to embrace a bigger world view rather than a narrow one. And he wants to see himself at the center of this. Jupiter and Sagittarius, he likes risk and adventure. He loves to throw the dice to see where it lands. He's kind of a gambler in life, really. Not always keen on commitment. Very sensitive emotional side. He's certainly vulnerable to emotional blackmail. He's not always clued up in uh, terms of his emotional intelligence going into situations. He's quite needy and he wants to be part of things, wants to be liked. And that means he rolls into situations uh, where he's vulnerable to manipulators who appear on the surface to be giving him what he so craves. Meanwhile, he's, he's going into a trap. Obviously, that describes Epstein quite well. Certainly charming and very friendly, but there's a very cold, impersonal side to him. Can be a snob, quite sanctimonious. He gets very caught up in his ideals. He can't always see that his way of thinking just isn't for everybody. He certainly likes to ponder and reflect. He questions everything, and yet he brings a lot of complexity into his life that he needn't. So he's got a hugely active imagination, maybe a little bit too active, that can lead him to misinterpret things bit of a dreamer as well, often likes to lose himself in terms of art, culture, or just having fun. There's a great need for escapism and to just block out the realities. So as I say, he's a risk taker, certainly lives life in full color. He will always have regrets and a lot of guilt. He'll have some great successes, also some big failures, and he likes to cover up his failures and never talk about them. I think if we dug deep, we'd probably find that he's put his foot in it a lot more than we know. And these have been kind of covered up because I also feel from his child that his mother has always protected him, covered up for him, almost encouraged him, encouraged him to believe that he's more than he was and hasn't encouraged him to be more realistic. And that could have led him into situations where he overstretched, overreached and either made a fool of himself or messed up. But I think that's kind of being covered up. So there's probably a very interesting past to Andrew that no, none of us know about at all. So he's a very confusing way of understanding life and understanding himself. And I think there's not a lot of clarity in terms of his self-understanding. Can be very charismatic, very playful. There's an adolescent spirit about him. Uh, can be kind and generous in the right kind of situations. Uh, but he's very restless and inconsistent. So while he's one thing to another one person, another person could perceive him entirely differently. Certainly hard for him to find satisfaction. And that's why he's so attracted to risks and extremes and often his boredom just drives him into trouble. So he, he seeks things that totally consume him because he has an abundance of energy and that leads him to do reckless things if there's not something to kind of really capture his attention or for him to knuckle down to. So I think now that he doesn't have any royal duties, he's probably going to be getting into even more trouble because of his of, of this nature that's just so restless, so hungry for action. So with this kind of sun in the eighth, I think that's where we're drawing this arrogance. 
He feels fearless because he thinks he's untouchable. He needs some kind of hard knocks of life. That's what he's needed. But he hasn't had that. He hasn't had the humbling experience because of his position. So it hasn't kind of rounded off that rather arrogant side. Certainly what comes across from Sun opposite Pluto is this overbearing, sometimes pompous, pompous, almost dictatorial attitude. He is hungry for power. I get the impression that he's always been jealous of Charles's position, that he's going to be king. And he's been desperately seeking out some place, some role to prove himself, not least to his mother. I think he's rather obsessed with the queen. They often mention that he's her favourite. I'm not sure if it's favourite in the way that we might conventionally think about it. I think she feels the most protected, protective of him because she realises that he was the most emotionally naive and vulnerable. I think she's also quite manipulative of him. And at the same time, she has uh, encouraged his arrogance also. I think she's covered up for him. I've seen this quite often where men who are either Aquarius or Pisces have a mother who's... Um, have a Scorpio moon, and their mother invariably encourages them to think a lot about themselves, uh, encourage, sort of covers up for them, protects them almost too much, and makes excuses for them. And I think this is what might have happened to him. So there's been no kind of learning role where he, he bumps his head and he has to step back and reflect. I feel too many excuses has been, have been made for him. So, uh, He's quite, I would say, aggressive sexually, although, you know, I don't mean to imply anything about that. These are only allegations. Can be very annoying to other people because of the sense of being entitled. Certainly very pushy as well. So I can see in his royal roles, maybe with Pitch in the Palace, he got far because he's quite pushy. Moon in the fourth house, I think it typifies the influence of family and heritage in his life. And also that his mother was a very powerful influence, which I have to emphasize because I'm kind of going to say that she's been the driving force behind some of the things that he's been up to. Obviously not the obvious ones. Uh, Neptune in the fourth, skeletons in the closet, secrets. Yes, I think there are a lot of secrets uh, to do with the family or to do with his own life that are being kept. Uh, Neptune square, the ascendant, a very deceptive nature. Yeah, I think he can be very tricky to deal with. He's, he's very good at uh, being an actor almost, playing a game, and he's been able to get away with it because of his position. He's willful. Um, I do think, in a way, his mother has undermined him. Even though she's very protective, I think she's also had an undermining role. There's a jealous side as well. Quite possessive, but highly motivated. Certainly a very determined streak. What Pluto in the second and Jupiter in the fifth also says is large potential losses due to misuse um, of speculation or investment or a particular arrogance in terms of money and investment. Um, Jupiter in the in Sagittarius, sometimes self-righteous, feels he's above the law, but there's also this fun-loving, adventurous streak. As I said with Mars conjunct Venus, there's the sex drive, passion, vitality, a um, lot of fun-loving, but also this impulsiveness with money. So what I'm seeing through this Pluto, the Jupiter placement, Sun opposite Pluto in the 8th, is a tendency to, to financial extremes. And I think he has kind of fancied himself as the family banker. I get this feeling from the chart that he sought to impress his mother and gain a role for himself by being a, a kind of mover and shaker, financial mover and shaker, getting involved in the world of high finance. Let's look at the royal family rather as a business. Let's not look at them as heads of state, people who have a ceremonial role, people who cut ribbons, people who go to functions and do charity work. Let's think of them as a business who want to maximize profit as all business does. And I see that Andrew wanted to fulfill a role in the royal family of maximizing their profits, their assets, kind of taking themselves to the next level, making them not just royalty, but billionaires to be on the stage with the other key billionaires on the world stage. You know, I think he wanted them to be more than a royal family. He wanted them to be right up there with the elites. This is just the feeling I'm getting from the chart, and I'm going to back it up with some other information. So, because um, Jupiter was present in his chart at times of crisis, notably at Annos Horribilis, which was in 1992, as you know, uh, Diane Charles were getting divorced, Andrew also got divorced to, from Fergie, and the Andrew Morton bo book came out. It was a really bad time for the royal family. I think the royals felt very insecure and were wondering if they could last as an institution at that point. And I think 
that was the time just after that that uh, Ghislaine got uh, Andrew involved with Jeffrey Epstein. And I think that was the whole deal. Andrew wanted to get involved with Jeffrey Epstein in order to kind of start moving money, maybe thinking ahead to when the royals weren't the royals anymore, they were just billionaires, but wanting to secure up all their assets and maximize their their profit, or what should I say, maximize their position financially, even if they weren't going to be royals anymore. I see that there was another crisis in the royal family through Andrew's chart in 2010, and that was the time when he was again rushing to see Epstein even after he was out of prison. And I wonder if the royals were a bit shaky because Jimmy Savile died in 2011. I wonder if they felt that revelations with him might come out and might impact them in some negative way, which could also compromise their position. So I think over the time the royals have occasionally, maybe more often than not, felt shaky about their future in British society and whether they would always be royals. And they wanted to kind of move their assets around so that whatever happened, they would retain a position of prominence in the, in the world in terms of their wealth and their ability to influence things via their wealth, even if not through their position as royals. That's just the feeling I'm getting. I will back it up with a little bit of information. I'm just going to throw this out there because some of my viewers might be interested. I did hear Anne-Marie Waters say that the British royal family have been told that by 2040 it will be Britain will be a majority Muslim country. Now, that could be by the demographics. But I do think with demographic changes, not only religious ones but cultural ones, you can see that their role is going to be undermined. I mean, if we're going to be living in a thoroughly multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society, is their role and will they still hold the same place in the hearts of British people when British people are made up of a very different mix? And are they looking forward to that and thinking ahead? Well, I think they are because, you know, they've always been known as a family that thinks ahead. They call it the firm, don't they? And they operate very much like a, like I say, like a business. So they may be thinking ahead. And maybe the role with Jeffrey Epstein wasn't so much Andrew just looking to have a good time or being compromised. Maybe it was also to do with financially securing assets, because I think that uh, Epstein was acting as an unofficial banker for billionaires or for high-level politicians, helping them have some slush funds, maybe helping them evade authorities, evade tax, do money laundering. Could have been any of these things. These are just my suggestions. It wasn't just about the sex. And I think the thing that the whole media are trying to um, go on and on and on about the sexual side. As awful as that is, I don't think it's the whole picture. I think there's a much wider picture to the Epstein thing, and the financial side of it certainly is under the radar and definitely needs more investigation. So back to some other... I want to back up what I've been saying here rather than just waffling on about stuff. So Norman Baker, who was a Liberal Democrat MP, was part of the Cabinet when Clegg was in with Cameron. He wrote a book called What Do You Do? It's about the royal family. It's called What Do You Do? Because you can imagine when the Queen meets people, she doesn't know what to say to them, does she? So invariably, she starts a conversation with, and what do you do? Or what does one do, I suppose? I'm sure it's a very short conversation, but anyhow. And his book was a kind of cost-benefit analysis of the royal household, and he looked to shine a light on their colossal cost to the taxpayer, which he says is a lot greater than what we're led to believe. He says there's a great level of secretiveness, and he says the effect of the royal is actually a drag on progressive change. So I like the fact he mentioned secretiveness, because I see this in Charles' chart, in Camilla's chart, in Andrew's chart with Neptune in the fourth. So what Norman Baker said is he's also kind of annoyed that royal wills are kept secret, so we don't really know when the Queen does die where this money's all going. He says the royal archives are private, and he also complains about the fact that the Queen and Prince Charles can shape and even veto laws that affect their personal assets and interests. So you see here, we're just not looking at two people who cut ribbons and, and shake hands with people, go to the Royal Variety performance. We're looking at people who can actually veto laws that would affect their personal assets. So they're not just ordinary millionaires and billionaires. They can veto laws that might affect their wealth. This is very important and gives them a unique possession. And you can also see why Anne, why Epstein 
was kind of interested in Andrew because I always wonder that it had to be a symbiotic relationship. Andrew was interested in Epstein for certain reasons, maybe financial reasons, whatever. Why was Epstein so interested in Andrew? If he's running a compromise operation, and he wants to get Andrew involved. What compromising information did he need? How did he feel he could use that information against Prince Andrew? And then we've got to say again, obviously, these royals are privy to more important things than what we're led to believe. Otherwise, what use would he have been to Epstein? I understand he has diplomatic immunity, Andrew. And I understand that he has access to people like uh, dictators in Kazakhstan, uh, people around the world who Epstein wouldn't necessarily have met you through Jocelyn because Jocelyn was mainly introducing him to the New York jet set and to uh, the glitterati and whatnot and to, and to regular billionaires maybe. But Andrew had access to leaders all over the world through his connections with the royal family who he could have potentially put Epstein in touch with. I guess that was a draw card as well. But we've got to ask what else was Epstein interested in in Prince Andrew, if he's running a compromise uh, operation. So to go back to Norman Baker, he also complains about the huge amount of public money which is spent on maintaining the royals. And he says this is not properly scrutinized. He says the establishment as a whole and the media is just too obsequious. So um, just to do a bit of background slightly, this um, Norman Baker, he was also very interested in the death of Dr. Kelly, and that was what him eventually led him to resign from the Lib Dem front bench because he wanted to write a, a report on Dr. Kelly. So he is quite deep thinking. So he said, you know, when it comes to the Tories, whatever the monarchy wants, they can have it. And he said the case in point is the refurbishing of Buckingham Palace. He says it was quoted as being £10 million in 2010, but it's gone up to £369 million. That's a huge increase. He said the whole of Buckingham Palace's palaces being funded, you know, their gold bells, gold whistles, everything's being funded by the taxpayer. And he just doesn't think that's right, bearing in mind food banks, cutbacks to police, all these things. But he says they get everything paid for. So what Baker tries to say in his book is they don't only get funds from the public or from the government. They've become an expert in uh, siphoning off everything that they can possibly get. He seems to think that they've become very clever in using the system. You know, we always hear about um, benefits cheats, gaming the system. He thinks at the other end of the scale, the royal family have begun to game the system because they've been in it for so long. They are very good at squeezing every ounce they can get out of the taxpayer. And uh, he says that's why they do need more oversight and why they're probably getting more money out of this whole shenanigan than anyone realizes. So why else do I, I'm saying that Prince Andrew fancied himself as a bit of a financial wheeler and dealer, and that's how he wanted to cement his relationship as the Queen's favorite, kind of in, uh, uh, ingratiate himself to her, and also to feel special and powerful, bearing in mind that he's not in line to the throne. So... Back on the 21st of May, there was an article by Patrick Sawyer on the BBC News website, and he was talking then about Prince Andrew being at the centre of a big controversy over his relationship with Kazakhstan, and there were allegations that he had business connections to the regime. So what he was accused of was trying to broker an £885 million deal between a Greek and Swiss consortium and the Kazakhstan government, which would have seen him get a commission and where he would have benefited to the tune of £4 million. So there were leaked emails that showed in April 2011, Prince Andrew used his relationship with Kazakh oligarch Kednez Rakishev to help a Greek utility firm and a Swiss finance house to bid for infrastructure contracts. There was also Aris Capital from Zurich and EDAP, Greek's largest water company, who wanted to build water and sewage networks in two of Kazakhstan's largest cities. He would have been offered a commission of 1%, which worked out at around 3.83 million for his role. That was what a source of the water company claimed. However, the deal fell apart in late 2011 because the Kazakh police opened fire on a group of striking oil workers killing 14, and EDAP had to pull out because of the political turmoil. So Buckingham Palace denied that Prince Andrew had ever helped these organizations pursue businesses in Kazakhstan, but the allegations that he stood to benefit from that deal were made by an unnamed source to the Daily Mail. Buckingham Palace said they weren't verified. But at the time, Prince Andrew was also working as the special trade envoy for Britain, and so his alleged involvement raised questions about conflict of interest, obviously. 
And he was also criticized for his close relationship with the regime, which was notoriously awful for human rights as well. So Prince Andrew's involvement in this deal, which of course is denied by Buckingham Palace, is alleged to have begun when he was approached in April by EDEP's chief executive, Nikos Bardas. And an EDEP source actually told the mail that the prince put them in touch with people who mattered in Kazakhstan and his help was completely invaluable. Even at moments when the deal looked like falling apart, he was a huge help. When we go, looking back at 2007, Prince Andrew sold his marital home, which had laid empty for five years, to Mr. Kulibayev for 15 a million, which was three million pounds more than the asking price. So that's also rather bizarre. I mean, if, if one of us was selling our house for three million pounds more than the asking price, I mean, that would raise questions, wouldn't it, of about what, what exactly the extra three million was going towards. So Prince Andrew was previously accused of cashing in on connections with oil-rich trading partners. So I think maybe that was why Epstein was so interested in him, because he had these connections to these utility companies, Kazakh regimes, oil-rich nations, etc. So Chris Bryant, an MP, foreign, a former foreign office minister, told the ter- Telegraph, this confirms what many people suspected about Prince Andrew. He has very questionable tastes when it comes to his business relationships. He said, when I was at the foreign offices, it was very difficult to see in whose interests he was acting. He doesn't exactly add luster to the royal diadem. He carried on to say, the story is very concerning because it shows that new trade arrangements were being negotiated without being placed in the context of the UK government's policy on human rights and also because the prince may have been benefiting personally from these deals. So, of course, Norman Baker again raised the question of the conflict of interests. He said, although Prince Andrew was supposedly prima facie acting as a trade envoy, he seems more interested in enriching himself than helping the UK. Of course, Buckingham Palace initially suggested the email was a forgery before they sought to block its publication, saying that while it was genuine, it would be a breach of the prince's privacy. So, there you go. A bit of double speak there. They initially say it's a forgery, and then they say that while it's genuine, it's a breach of the prince's privacy. So I think that displays what I was getting at. I looked at the chart. I saw this kind of financial wheeling and dealing, the seeking of power, this looking to uh, be involved above his capability, really, in the finance world in order to maybe ingratiate himself to the queen or to improve the finances of the royals or to secure their financial future post-royalty or post them being involved in the British state. And uh, there we have some suggestions of it coming out in the media. Possibly there's more to it than just these these notions, but these allegations, or I, I, they seem quite substantial to me. Maybe there's more to it. So that's what I feel about Prince Andrew. And I wonder this year where the more is going to come out about these financial dealings. It's almost like he's fair game now. A Pandora's box has been opened. He's now sort of become the black sheep of the family, maybe a little bit more vulnerable. Now, Camilla Tomini, who's the Telegraph's royal correspondent, has been saying, as have others, that when Prince Charles takes over, which, as you know, I've said I think is going to be this year because I feel that Pluto, Saturn conjunction in Capricorn signifies the time Prince Charles is going to take over as king. She says he's going to slim down the royals. It's only going to be Prince Charles, Camilla, William and Kate and their children, Meghan and Harry and their children, and he's going to cut the rest out. So he's looking at a slim-lined version. And I'm thinking if this thing with Andrew becomes a lot bigger, maybe the contagion can even reach the Queen, where people will begin to ask the question, how could she have not known, especially going back maybe, you know, she's very old now, she can't be expected to know anything, but everything. But going back further, people might just begin to ask, What did she know? And I'm wondering if that might be a cause for her to abdicate, to hand over to Charles. Because I've been strongly seeing this movement to Prince Charles this year. Um, Someone asked me a question about, will the Queen pass it over to William? So many people have thought that. I say definitely not. Prince Charles will become king. However, there's a question in my mind, if William will get passed over and it'll go straight to his oldest child. Because the funny thing is, with Neptune going into Aries in 2025, there were two times in British history when we had a child king, when Neptune moved into Aries. So I'm wondering if something strange is going to happen where it's actually William who's going to be passed over and we'll have a child king. If the monarchy lasts, 
you know, to that point, we don't know. So I'm, I'm definitely thinking that this year there's going to be major stuff going on with the royal family. Um, yeah, like I say, it's, it's hard to see anything happening with the Queen health-wise, really. She seems rather fit. Will she abdicate? Or is this thing with Andrew going to be what blows it all out of the water? I'm very interested to watch this space and see. Okay, one last thing about Harry and Meghan. Um, this is actually, my mom made this prediction. She said that Meghan, very much like Madonna, do you remember when Madonna married Guy Ritchie? And she was coming over to the UK to do the whole British thing. She was sending Lourdes to the Cheltenham Girls School. And, you know, she was kind of out doing country things, living in the countryside, doing horse riding, adopting the sort of British life. Didn't last very long, did it? And my mom said she saw Meghan in very much the same vein. She said, I don't see Meghan putting up with not being able to speak out, not being able to do her political activism, and just having to go from being a kind of normal person up to the age of 37 to being someone on whom all these restrictions are placed. And I agree with that. I think Meghan and Harry will go on to have another child, but I do think they're going to not so much abdicate, because they can't abdicate in their position, but leave their positions as royals. Because I think there's no reason they can't continue charity work not being royals. They'll still be major celebrities. Harry's still going to be Charles' son, so he's still going to get all the police protection. He's still going to get all the publicity. He's still going to get all the the wealth that goes along with that. So the only if they stop becoming royals, they're not really going to lose out at all. And what they gain is they can be become a lot more political, which I think Meghan does want to do. So possibly they've had the royal wedding. They've had all royalty can offer them. They bored with the rest of it. And I think they want to move away from the royals, denounce it, lose their titles, but go on to kind of uh, still tap into the wealth and the privilege, but do a lot more politics. So that's my prediction for Harry and Meghan. But as I once said before, I don't think they'll make more than five years of marriage. Sorry to be negative on that one, but most marriages do go west, so I don't think um, it's unusual. I hope you enjoyed this. It was rambling at times because there was a lot in my head that I needed to put forward, and I tried to articulate it in a logical fashion, and I hope I brought it to you in a, a sensible way that made sense, and I hope you don't you forgive me for the podcast on this one.